Okay. All right. Welcome. Go ahead. All right. Thanks for uh, showing up today. My name is Robbie. I'm pretty sure I've had you in class before, right, Charlie? Yes. Yes. yes and I'm All here. Right. Too. All right. How are you today? Good. Excellent. Excellent. So uh, I'm just going to go through some of uh, what I do typically on a daily basis, just like how to make my pots and kind of go through it. As you have questions, please feel free to ask. So. Um, you just need to start here. I'm going to start with a, uh, a three-pound ball of clay, and I'm just going to make a bowl out of it real quick. So the first thing is centering, and so you know you know how this goes, <laughs> but um, just trying to get a stiff press into the clay, kind of creating a frame with my hand to make the clay go into the middle of the wheel where I want it. Adding water as needed so that the clay slips through my hand. Makes my space. <laughs> wow. And we never saw your face before. That's the only difference. <laughs> yeah, right. Up. We've had masks on this whole time, right? <laughs> <laughs> You make it look so easy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's the practice it does for you, right? <laughs> so, so when you're pressing it down like that, what are you what are you trying to do when you press it back down? So um, the process that I'm going through right now, this is called coning. So what I'm trying to do is work the clay into a. Uh, so it's it's getting the clay into the center of the wheel, but I'm also trying to get uh, if if the if I just do this and just try to center the outside of the clay. The inside can still be kind of off-centered or not centered completely at the base here. So what I'm doing is I'm constricting the clay. So if you see it, the width of it right now, I squeeze it in, see how it's changing diameter, it's getting much centered, right? So that's allowing me to move the clay at the base to get everything worked into the middle of the wheel. And then I can just compress it back down because I don't want it to be that tall and narrow. Okay. So by, by pushing it back down, I'm just compressing it so that I get it back into the shape that I want it to be at to make the object. So depending on what form I'm making, whether it be a, a mug or a bowl, uh, they're going to have different sizes. So like right now, this is too wide for a mug. I can barely put my hand around it, so I don't want to try to make a, a mug out of this. So, But this is a good size for a bowl because it has a nice wide base. So when you have the edges of the bowl coming out, it's not going to teeter totter on a tiny little base. So, changing the size of the mound of clay at the beginning. So, like if I wanted a really big mug, I would start with something that fit in my hand like this, right? But because I'm going to start with a bowl, I'm going to start with a much wider base like this. And if I were making a plate, I would just spread it down and flat across the wheel even wider. So, learning mm -hmm. how to move that clay against the wheel head is really important. And changing the shape of the clay while it's being centered basically helps you get towards the end result or the object that you're trying to make. So from here, I'm going to open the clay. I'm just going to push down into the center, just depressing the middle of the clay down. As I press, it's moving the clay out to the side. And then I'm going to open interior space of it. Now from here, I'm going to start expanding the walls of the bowl. So now that it's open, press in and start to thin that clay out. And as the clay thins, it expands and starts to get taller. Oh. I'm just trying to move through the clay to make it the same thickness all the way through. You see, I'm starting out with a nice big V shape. It's almost like a flower pot to begin with. But then as I get it 
to the right thickness where it's thin enough for something that you would use in the kitchen, that's when I'm going to start to put the shape in it that you start to recognize as a bowl. So now it's nice and thin. I've moved a lot of the clay up into the wall of the pot here. And I'm going to use a uh, tool. This is called a potter's rib. So it's just a, uh, this one's made of plastic particularly, and this one here is made of metal. And I'm going to use it, one on the inside, one on the outside. And I'm just going to start shaping by pressing and pressing this angle. You can already see where I've just started touching that clay there with that edge. Pressing into that piece of clay. And I'm just catching it with the rib on the outside and holding it, I'm just flexing it at an angle like that. So then I just touch it and start to push from the inside out, expanding that clay into that round bowl shape that you're familiar with. Again, it's joined by a three table tennis room. <laughs> there we have a nice big bowl. And then I'll just get the water out of the inside. If I want to, I can just Roll this rim over a little bit. Hmm. Like that. There you go. Lump of clay, the bowl. <laughs> I'm just cleaning up some of that excess clay at the outside there. Take that, run the wire underneath that bowl finish. Pretty easy, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> it is fun watching you work, but it is. I'm just envisioning myself trying to do that. <laughs> we have some examples around here. We have some beginner baby steps around here. It takes time, it takes time. <laughs> All right, so then I'm just gonna try to get this released from the wheel. Try to get it. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Oh go. All right, there we go. Wow. Wow. What time is it? Let's look like what's the what is the chicken? <laughs> I'm gonna take the same that same amount of clay and I'm gonna turn it into a different shape. So we've got another three pounds here. Gonna start with centering. Toning, pushing that clay up. You see when I push it back down, I'm pushing down and in. See how that clay leans forward when I start to press it back down. I'm pressing it up. And then I press it back down, just like so it sinks right down into the middle of the wheel. So is there a balancing act with your hands? Like one has to push, the other one has to stabilize? Like both, both hands are active. One hand, my left hand, this hand here, is always bracing and stabilizing. It's my constant back pressure. I actually have it locked against the splash pan. You can see right here, my forearm is touching this area right here. That's locking my arm in place. So I'm creating just kind of a neutral pressure so the clay can't move past my hand. So if I press hard enough, and I start to press down on top, you see it can't really change width very easily because my arm is just braced in place. However, if I take my hand on the opposite side, you can see in the top view, kind of pull in towards that hand, then I'm squeezing the clay together. So my right hand is kind of active hand, shaping and forming what that mound of clay looks like, where my left hand really isn't doing much except for holding the clay still. So mm -hmm. if you watch happening, you see that left hand is hardly moving at all. It's just holding and compressing, giving a constant back pressure. Same thing holds true when I open the form up. So when I start to press down into the center of the clay, 
You see the left hand stays in place. It's just supporting that clay because as I press down into the middle, the clay wants to press out to the side, but my left hand is saying, no, you can't go anywhere, right? <laughs> and then when I open across the bottom, same thing, my left hand is giving back pressure. So I'm basically creating a series of plants. I'm just holding and pressing. It's like I'm pinching the clay like this, except I'm using two hands and I'm just using the heel of my palm to provide the back pressure for the pinch, essentially. So here's where things get a little different. When I go to work with the clay, once it's in the, once all of the solid mass of clay is in this ring. So my left hand now transitions to the inside of the pot and my hand is supporting the interior space now, but also applying back pressure for when I push out here on the outside of this band of clay. And it would work the same if I held a steel rod on the inside of the clay. If I just held it and stiff and it couldn't move, it was mounted to the ceiling or whatever it may have been. And it was just sitting here and I pressed against the side, the clay would move up when I pressed against it and it was just providing back pressure. So technically this hand, you can see, watch this left hand, it doesn't move as I can press the outside, right? Everything stays the same, you, you watch the clay move up. So what that hand is doing is providing a constant back pressure. And it's keeping the form stable all the time. So my left hand is the stabilizer, my right hand is the active mover. And then what you see most of the time is you watch the hands move at the same rate, right? And that's how you're used to seeing Potter's hands move. And that's me just creating a compression and then holding still. And I just move my hands up together very slowly as I'm moving through the clay, kind of like this. So it's not like it hasn't changed. The only thing that's changed is I'm trying to move higher now. And my hand can only go down so far. And once it gets really tall, then I have to kind of, I can't just leave my hands stable and still in there like this. So you'll start to watch potters get this. Compression, and then you see their hands move up through the clay. And it's just stabilizing on the inside, compressing on the outside. The opposite's true. When I did the bowl, I had to kind of switch roles. When I was the clay and spreading it out at an angle, then I was actually actively pushing with my hand on the inside and stabilizing with my hand on the outside and pulling out an angle like this. So it was a, it was the same thing. It was just a role reversal for the hand. So the, the right hand was the stabilizer and the left hand was the active force pushing out and pulling up. So it really just depends on where you're moving the clay to. Robbie, how many years have you been doing this? Uh, 15. Wow. Started in 2006. And, did you uh, go to college or take classes or did you just teach yourself? I'm primarily self-taught, but I learned at the college in Salzburg University. So the way it works, was my wife, Sarah, was taking uh, classes at Salisbury University, finishing up her philosophy degree and her uh, friends and advisors were telling her she should take some art classes and they convinced her to take pottery. <laughs> and um, she brought some clay home and I had always been kind of an active painter, drawer, musician. And, when she brought home clay, I was hooked because it was just this type of medium where I could do, I was like, oh, I can make anything I can think of. That's really interesting, <laughs> right? So, <laughs> so she got you into it by accident? Um, I mean, I guess by accident, sure. <laughs> Vicariously through, through her bringing clay home, it kind of just worked out that way. Um, she did her first semester and just pottery one which is basic pots where you're just like doing everything by hand so she would bring clay home and make stuff by hand started going to the studio with her after hours when classes weren't in session 
I'd sit down at the wheel and just practice. And I, I'll tell you, I didn't make anything good on the wheel for like two years because like I said, I taught myself, I didn't have any real instruction besides just watching other people work. And um, her second semester, she took an uh, independent study in uh, Native, traditional Native American pottery. And that's still a big influence on the work that I make today. Even though I have a show up right now in uh, Berlin of some low fire bottles that are all really inspired by that work that I made when I first started making pottery. So uh, yeah, and anyway, from, from the point where she was taking that independent study and then she took ceramics to it at the same time. So apparently we got hooked pretty quick because she took two pottery classes in her last semester at college. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> so uh, she took a ceramics two, which is basic throwing. And she started learning more about throwing and she got mad at me because I started getting better than her. <laughs> and and, <laughs> and um, after that semester, uh, all of the ceramics techs at the college uh, left. They either moved out of town or went on to different things. And so they hired Sarah on that summer during the summer semester uh, under Marie Cavallero, who was the head of the ceramics department at the time, hired her as the ceramics tech. And then for the spring, or sorry, for the fall semester that followed, uh, Jim Hill actually hired me as the head 3D technician for sculpture, ceramics, and glass. And so I started working at the college full time. Well, it was like full time for me. I spent more hours there than I, than I would have. I was getting paid part time, but it felt like full time because I was constantly there. And um, yeah, that's where I learned how to work on kilns, uh, learned how to fix wheels, learned how to make clay, make glazes, uh, all those fun things. And, basically ended up having a master's type program at my disposal where I could just experiment with whatever I wanted without hindrance on a budget that wasn't mine. <laughs> I built kilns, you know, experimented with whatever I wanted to and went from there. So after 12 years at the college, I, I finally left. I was teaching as an adjunct professor when I left. And then I started just working from home, primarily doing wholesale and custom orders and consignments and then selling work to the gallery like at the Ocean City. And then last August, I got hired as the pottery manager at the Art League. So, you know, it's been a, <laughs> it's been a journey, but <laughs> it's been a fun one. All right, so I've thrown this cylinder and I've gotten it as thin as I want it. So now I can start kind of shaping it into whatever form I want. I'm just going to make a little vase of it. It's basically, when you make a cylinder, how you want to shape it, it's kind of like what I was talking about with the bowl, where depending on where you push on the clay, you'll make it change shape. So if I want it to puff out, I can push from the inside. You see the clay change shape right there. It can start to puff out. And if I want it to sink back in or compress it back in, then I just wrap my hands around the outside, and I can give it a little color. You watch this diameter change. So depending on what you do through the form, you can change the shape to whatever you want. All right? If I want it more narrow at the bottom and then expanding towards the top, something like that. But what I like to do is use these ribs. And I like to use the angles that the ribs already have. And I'll start to put in these nice soft curves. moving through the piece. And then you can even use the, this rib has some little angles on it here. And I can use that ridge to make like a false line that says this is a separation between the shoulder and the neck. Right. And then I can use this little round edge here and I can just push that in right there, wrap the clay around that rib, give a nice soft little angle there. And then we make ourselves a happy little pot. Right? <laughs> felt like Bob Ross for a second saying the soft curve here, tiny line here. <laughs> Have to tie it together, right? All what right, are your so, favorite things to make? Um, I primarily make bottles and large platters, and then I make a lot of fun decorative mugs and piggy banks and stuff like that. So, um, 
I think I, I like the bottles the most because they're the most challenging things that I make for the most part. And then there's also like cultural stuff that I do that is uh, a lot of fun to work on. That. Ravi, I'm curious. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Ravi. It's okay, go ahead. Um, I'm curious about how you get such narrow necks on some of the like big pots. They come to such a yeah. tiny little point. How right. do you do that? <laughs> so the um, process that I showed you earlier where I kind of compress around the, the edge and push this clay in, it's just doing that over and over and over again until you get it narrower, narrower, narrower. And it can be tricky on a really large piece. That's why it's really challenging, why I said it's really challenging, because it's, it takes a lot of time to actually pull that clay all the way in to get a bottleneck that thin. I also use a slightly different clay body than the one I'm using right now, which is, uh, this is a, a stoneware, but it's as close to porcelain as you can get. So it doesn't have a lot of grog. And grog is like a uh, once fired clay, it's been disc fired, so it's kind of porous. And then you grind it up, smash it down into a powder, pulverize it, and then you add it back to the clay body and that makes it shrink less. So <laughs> it also um, provides more rigidity in the clay. So you can make more extreme forms and it'll hold itself up. Whereas mm -hmm. this clay is really good for functional wear, like bowls, plates, mugs because it doesn't have that grit in it. It just has a nice smooth surface for the glazes to lay on. And then you don't have to do much to the bottom of it when it comes out of the kiln to make it nice and smooth. Um, so yeah, it's just, uh, um, I have done the demonstration a lot of times, but it takes a little while to make a bottle with a, with a bottleneck. Um, it would probably take me over a half hour to do like a, a bottle with a tiny neck just because of how long it takes to get the, the clay back in. So maybe not the demonstration for this point in time since we only have an hour, but um, it is a fun, <laughs> a fun process. And maybe I can make a little one real quick to kind of like just maybe not I as think, extreme as some of the bigger ones. But <laughs> I think I understand the process now that you say it. Um, I can kind yeah. of do like a, a miniature real quick just to kind of show what it's I guess like. I was imagining like you had to have your hands inside it, but that makes no sense because the right. neck is so teeny, um, but that's like bottles. the very last step. Yeah. yeah. Bottles are an illusion. That's what I like to <laughs> yeah. say when people ask me how I make them because they look at them and they're like, how'd you get your hand inside this yeah. tiny neck? And the real actuality of it is that Yes, I had my hand inside the thing, but I didn't have to while I was creating the bottleneck, right? So you start off making your cylinder. 90% of things start out of cylinders. So a bottle is one of those, those items, your bottles, vases, mugs, pitchers, jars, all those things are basically cylinders. And then you just change it from there. I'm just going to throw kind of a basic cylinder real quick. All right. And so the trick about bottles is that what ends up happening is that you end up cutting away some of the clay at the base to kind of drive the bottom in a little bit. So that's kind of one of the parts of the illusion that makes it look more extreme. And then the, the center of the bottle just gets puffed out just a little bit. Less than you would think. Like even that's enough for a nice little bottle. All right. And then I'm just going to compress and just start to bring this clay in, getting the little thick, so I want to thin it out. And then this one needs just a little bit taken off the top too. You see, it's just bringing that clay in. Uh, 
and then repeat. <laughs> Thin it out. So as you compress the clay in, it gets thicker. So that's why I have to keep thinning it out every time I bring it in. And then again, now you can see this thing's coming down to just a really fine point. Whoa. Wow. And then I just bring that up into a little neck. Once I have the neck, then I can start finishing the shape. So what that means is I'll take this rib and I'll just round out the shoulder to kind of match the body. Round. Sometimes I'll even add that, that fake line that makes it look like this is the separation between neck and shoulder. So I just kind of drive the edge of this rib into the bottle there. that. And then I take this bottleneck and I try to ignore everything below it now, right? So this, now I just imagine this is a tiny cup, right? <laughs> this is a tiny little cylinder and I ignore everything below it. It's not, not really important now. So now I'm just focusing on just this little bit here. And I just start to, sorry, I'm over top of this thing. Start to get in right here and just keep bringing that in until it's a little bit of nothing really. And then I'll take and cut here. Should cut the top off? So there you go, right? So it's like that's amazing. Right. It wow. makes it look like it's um <laughs> it makes it look more challenging than than it is. <laughs> I mean it's it's tough, um. right? Like I, I definitely forced <laughs> through this one and this top's not perfect. And if I spent more time, like the actual amount of time that I like to spend with bottles, like I would try to get everything nice and perfect. You can see it kind of spears off a little bit, but this gives you the idea in a very quick demonstration of how the bottle is kind of an illusion. Basically, it's it's not that my hands were never inside of it, you know, it's like obviously, but then you just take and you constrict the base and you constrict the neck and it gives it this nice uh, illusion of this air, the big bulbous thing with the tiny little tops. And so, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to go through um, a couple of different uh, cylinders real quick, just kind of different ways of shaping. So I spend a lot of time making mugs and different drinking vessels. And there's a lot you can do with just a basic drinking vessel that can be very fun and artistic. So I'll just show you kind of some of the quick designs that can be made. So in 30 minutes, you turned out three finished products. Pretty much. Yeah, pretty much. Um, and I, I work a bit faster when I'm not talking. <laughs> but it's, um, it's uh, that's pretty I mean, amazing, though. I mean, if you look at the if you look at the items behind you, that's that's pretty amazing in 30 minutes to me. Yeah. So basically, the cylinders that I make um, for for wholesale orders, I can make basically a cylinder every two minutes if I'm focusing on just making a cylinder. Wow. For, for what kind of orders, but what would you say? What's that? What you said about make cylinders for what? When I make cylinders for custom orders or wholesale. Oh, custom um, orders. When, okay. I, when I'm doing production work. So when I'm, when I'm trying to basically make as much as possible, as fast as possible, <laughs> 
I, I pretty much work at like two minutes per cylinder. Two minutes. <laughs> Do you always create things like with intention to sell or do you just sit there and do what you're doing right now and find yourself with a whole room full of items? I, I have a, I have two ways that I approach what I do. Uh, the first way is most of the time, the things I'm making are, are already sold, right? That's, that's wholesale. So, and that's what feeds me and keeps the lights on, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> buy, buys more clay. And so, <laughs> If I'm if I'm focused on doing that, then you know it's the intention is set, um, and it's a nice. It, it actually is kind of the best thing to me. It's better than when I was doing shows or doing consignment, where you make a bunch of stuff and it just sits around until it randomly sells. And so, what I've gotten away from is doing that. I'm not trying to make a bunch of stuff that I think will sell to you know mass market or like pay attention to trends or try to fit into some niche thing because it's not what I enjoy doing. I did it for a long time. I tried to just make product to sell and it wasn't fun. It, it kind of drains the fun out of, out of the experience. So, but if I know that I'm making something and it's for an intended purpose, like I, I make mugs for a race and all of the finalists from the race, the people who cross the finish line all get a mug, right? That's a really nice, thing it's a wholesale order so i know like i'm making it i know it's sold but then i also enjoy the reason that it's being made right i it's a something that someone's going to prize and that makes me feel good because i'm making these things so people are going to really enjoy this this object so it makes me have a little bit more passion while i'm making it right so it's more enjoyable so it's not that making a wholesale is that doesn't suck the life out of it like just making stuff that's going to sit in a box until you randomly sell it one day like that's kind of a obnoxious way to do it um which is what I've gotten away from. So now when I make work that's not sold, right? Not for wholesale, then what I'm going to do is just make it for me. They're objects that I like to make and I don't care if anyone buys them, right? They're still gonna go on a shelf or go in a gallery, but they're things that I was passionate about making. So I make um, like sculptural pieces, like uh, mugs that have um, like bodies, like busts. And I do that because it's something I like. It mixes my sculptural, it mixes the challenge of like turning this form into a sculpture, right? So I make this as my base canvas and then I can turn that into a sculpture. It's something really fun for me. And I don't mind if they sit there for a while because I can enjoy them while they're there. Or if I'm gonna- Very popular item yeah, here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and that's a nice thing, right? It's something that I enjoy making and other people enjoy them as well. So it works out where it's kind of like, I'm making something for me and other people want want it and that's a win-win. It's the way I'd rather do things. So typically if I'm just gonna sit down and make items and I'm making them for me personally because I want to, not because I have to. <laughs> so I tend to make a lot of bottles and because they're a form I really like to make. And then I make some sculptural pieces. And then most of the other things I make are either gonna be because someone's ordered something. So I started doing a set of uh, tiki mugs because a friend of mine ordered some a set of mugs for uh, a wedding right oh, those so, are so neat this is basically the same cylinder just turned into a sculpture right so and this is a really fun thing for me to make where i can take this form and then sculpt this face onto it right <laughs> wow and, but now i'm like getting to the point where i really enjoy making them and i think even after this custom order is over i'm going to keep making them because i enjoy it right <laughs> so, so there's like things that end up happening where someone will kind of request something or ask me if i can do something and i'm always like i'll try and see what happens and then you, sometimes you just get lucky and you're like i really like doing this and keep, you keep going with it um, I make the piggy banks, the ones that are upstairs in the gallery right now. Um, they're an object or an item that I was asked to make for a, a lady a while back as a consignment or a wholesale for her gallery space in Berlin. I started making them and I just really enjoyed making them. So now I've kind of taken the base, basic form, the, the basic pig, and I've started playing with it. And so I kind of uh, pretend that the pigs are dressing up like, like it's Halloween. So I call it their cosplay. They're really cool. They're really and cool. So like, 
So it's a piggy bank, right? But it'll be a piggy bank that looks like a bumblebee. So it still has all the features of the pig, still has the pig ears, but now it has antenna and it's painted like a bumblebee, right? So it's like, I try to just take it and push it a little bit further, take that idea if I really like making it and see what I can turn it into. So that's kind of the, uh, <laughs> I actually have a couple um, here just to kind of show. I, I did one as a, uh, this is a custom order. So this is a, a piggy bank and it has a, a unicorn horn and wings, right? So it flies. But you see, it's still a pig. It's got a curly tail, it's got its little ears, right? So it's still a piggy bank, but it, <laughs> it's got its own character. And then we had a couple that were made on stream. So um, I, I work live a couple of days a week. And so I made this guy. This is um... <laughs> that is so cute. He's got a little monocle and a mustache. <laughs> this is Humphrey Hanswell, right? And then uh, this is so that's probably the bottle, right? The mouth. This is his wife, Henrietta Hanswell. She's got her uh, op opera glasses and her uh, <laughs> little curls of hair and uh, nice big eyelashes. She's ready to go out on the town, obviously. So. <laughs> so how do you go about making those? Like, do you make it um, on the wheel? Yeah, so the basic form, the bottle shape, is this, like, puffed out with an open top. Mm -hmm. And then I take it and flip it on its side. So you can see this thrown form. Mm -hmm. This bottle, I gotta like oh, yeah. around here. It's thrown like this. So you see the basic thrown wow. form simple. Uh -huh. vertically here. It's just the cylinder that's kind of puffed out and collared in at the top, and then you just turn it sideways, and then you build on top of that all your little additions. Oh, wow. Yeah. I would crush the body when I was putting the feet on, I'm sure. <laughs> well, the, the, um, the clay is what we call leather hard at that stage. So it's a um, it's like a stiff, it's still flexible and firm, so it holds its shape, but it's still wet and malleable, so you can bend it and twist it if you wanted to. So it's not like crushable, it's just kind of like okay. it would shrink or sag. <laughs> so like if I tried to put something on this bottle right now, it would just squish because it's so wet. But if I let it dry out for a while, then I can actually stick things on it. And that's when I would do like handles, right? If I wanted to put a handle on this cup, I couldn't do it right now. I'd have to wait until it was a little stiffer, more dehydrated. And then I can pull a handle off of it and it doesn't like crush the, the cylinder while you're putting the handle on because otherwise, like when I push on it, right, it would like see how it pushes the shape in mm -hmm. because it's so soft. So when I put the handle on, it just it holds its shape and I can press in and do the different things. So there's different stages or points of time that you work on the clay to get it to do what you want it to. So, Robbie, are those feet just stuck on, or is there like a little superstructure, a little wire or something? No, they are they are attached. So, when you want to stick two pieces of clay together, you basically do um, you take this stuff, this flip, this wet clay, and, and you just use it to two pieces of clay, and it sticks together. So, um, they're actually physically attached, and once it's fired, it will it will fire together as if it's one piece. So it's not like uh, I see. there's no no wires or anything. It's just physically stuck together, and then those pieces fuse once it goes through the firing. So they're actually stuck. To, it's like putting um, mortar between two bricks, right? So you okay. put the mortar in, and then those two bricks are fused together. Except that you're using the same clay, right? So it's like you're not using some different material. It just all of a sudden it becomes. It's like taking two pieces. It becomes one. So. Yeah, you can you can take any number of pieces of clay, stick them together. As long as you do it correctly, you can make any any form that you can think of. Mm. I could put you know arms on a sculpture, on a statue. You know, you can just keep adding bits and pieces to it until you create a more and more elaborate form. That's kind of what I mean. Like when I was saying, I realized I could make anything I thought of. Right? <laughs> because once you start realizing how like you can take this form and this form or these pieces and this sculpture and stick it together. And now you've got, you know, this random crazy thing that you put together just because you, you imagined or thought of doing it. So it's a lot of, a lot of that. So what I'm going to do is uh, get back to this uh, shaping uh, right here and just kind of show you a couple of things that, are, that I think are interesting. Uh, the first one's just going to be a real quick 
movement. I'm just going to show you kind of what it looks like. I'm going to do a spiral design in this piece. So I'll clean this form up, clean the surface. I'm just going to take this rib here. And I'm just going to start to kind of press up through. All right, so I drew a line here. I'm going to try to follow between this line as it comes around. Oh, you just following it with his inside figure. So there you go. That's a uh, spiral design that I put in some mud. Pretty neat, right? It's like a little corkscrew. So that's just me moving my hand faster than the wheel is spinning. So if the wheel is going, you can watch the sponge go around, right? So that every time the sponge gets back here, it's one rotation. So if I move my hand up faster than it makes that rotation, then it creates a spiral in the piece. So basically, I just have to move faster than the wheel spinning in order to create that spiral. And then I take that, that idea, right? The spiral. And then you can take that and turn that into a more elaborate form. So I'll show you what the kind of the next phase of that process looks like. So these are, this is basically a technique called thrown and altered, where you take a form, you throw it, you have a base base shape and then you alter it into a different form, something a little bit more asymmetrical. Uh, the wheel is just made to make symmetrical forms. So if you want to make anything asymmetrical, you have to kind of push, pull, twist, turn, add things, cut things away to make it have a little bit more character. And so I've kind of spent a lot of time figuring out how to do all of those things to get a lot of different types of forms. Um, I've made a lot of like thrown sculpture. You throw it and cut parts away or add parts to it, or push it, pull it, sculpt it into different shapes. I'm just kind of pushing through making this cylinder real quick. There we go. He's nice. Hmm? What is happening? Stupid. When I have a drink of water in the morning, now it's kind of it's warm in the morning. It's weird. Really? That's not good. The first sip. And then the second cup is cold. I don't know why. Was it sitting in the reservoir instead of like in the freezer? All right. So for this next shape, I'm going to kind of use something similar in what I just did, except I'm going to be a little bit more, uh, I'm going to have a little bit more movement. I'm going to press in. I'm going to use this uh, wooden dowel rod to press in against mm -hmm. the clay. But then I'm going to kind of move my hand as I start to press in. So we'll see. So you get yourself a nice soft, it kind of starts to highlight the softness of the clay, the, the fact that it's malleable and can be pushed and twisted in different ways. It's just a quick Decorating technique that alters the form and the shape gives you a completely different look. And so I kind of find these different designs just by playing. You know, you think of one thing, you're like, oh, I make the spiral this way. What if I kind of don't do it so evenly, right? <laughs> what if I make a little bit more uh, quickly or move up and down? And so I'll show you a couple of examples of what these look like as um, almost finished pieces, as this way, basically. So I showed you the uh, 
sticky faces, which are basically the same thing. You just take that cylinder and then you sculpt it into a shape. And then the, and this is a version of that spiral mug. It has a, a spiral in it. And then when I put the handle on, I'll put a little tail that comes off and kind of trails around the piece around the side just to kind of accent the movement. Here's one that has the. That's the, cool. Like the one, I, like the one I just made, where it goes up and down and kind of has a, an uneven spiral moving up the side of the form. And then there's other shapes that can be made, like this. Is a um, you can see it has an undulating foot. The sculpture, instead of it being shaped horizontally, I shaped it vertically. So as I threw the piece, I pushed into the sides to make these marks here. I also pulled and sculpted the rim so that it has a lightly raised limb and rim in different parts. You can also see where the rim kind of pinches in in the lobes of the areas. And then I also did the kind of wrap with the tail. This is just kind of different things that you can do with this form. Bobby, how long does it have to dry before you add like the handle and all of the extras to it? It depends on the humidity, basically. Um, if I run a dehumidifier, I could work on it in a couple hours. Uh, if it's just kind of like a 50% humidity, no dehumidifier running, then I'll typically wait a day, come back the next day. And if I wrap, wrap it in plastic, actually these boards here are all pieces that are just waiting for handles or sculpture um, for the tiki faces or for uh, production work. And I put plastic on them to keep them wet. And if I wanna keep them very wet, then I put them on plastic, so I'll take a board, put plastic on the board, put the mugs on that, and then layer that in plastic, and it makes like a little wet box, so it can't dehydrate. Oh, <laughs> so wow. You keep things wet indefinitely, as long as you take care of it. I mean, even under plastic like that, they will eventually dehydrate, because the plastic is slightly porous. But the um, if I went in and sprayed it, like spritzed it with water or left a damp sponge in there, it would stay wet for as long as I wanted it to stay wet for. So you can, you have to take care of your, your work, you know, know how long it's going to take you to get back to it. Um, if you know that you want to finish it in an hour, then maybe you put a fan on it or turn the humidifier on. If you know that you're going to wait till the next day. So typically that's what I like to do. I'm going to sit down, I'm going to throw like 40 pieces, right? And then I'll have those 40 pieces set. And then I don't want to work on them that night. So I'll just cover them in plastic, come back the next day and uncover them until they're ready to put handles on. And then I'll just do all the handles at once. So it's kind of create my own production now. Like I'll throw all the cylinders today, do all the handles tomorrow, and then I can put logos or whatever the uh, finishing touches that are needed for those pieces. Cool. And then they, how long does it take them to dry before you you put them in the kiln straight from there? No. Um, okay. So yeah. Sorry, I missed that. I kind of got sidetracked. Uh, the drying time is basically whenever it's dry, right? so, kind of where I was getting at, like it can stay wet for as long as you want it to be wet, but then you can dry it out whenever it's dried out. You can't put it in the kiln until it's completely dry and it will, you have to kind of know when it's dry. So you have to wait until it's, uh, one of the kind of things that you can tell is if you pick up a piece and it still feels cold or you can see a color difference actually, like there will be, um, it'll look like white up top and then kind of a darker color at the bottom. And that means there's still water in the cup at the base of it, but it's dehydrated at the top. So depending on what it feels like, how it, it, you have to start to know when it's completely dry. You don't just, it doesn't say, you know, there's no sticker on it that says I'm dry, right? So you have to, like, you have to just pay attention to it. Uh, typically, I wait a week. It can be done much faster. I've finished pieces from start to finish in a week before, but that that's like you're forcing it to do that. You're you're making it dry quickly. You're going to get it in the kiln in a couple of days. But if I'm just making pieces and I know I can wait, 
then I can give it basically a week just out on the shelf with nothing around, like no plastic over it. It's just finished sitting there. And a week later, it should be dry enough to work in the kiln. There's no, no set in stone thing that says, you know, this is this piece is ready to go in the kiln. You just have to kind of get used to get used to what the clay looks like, how it feels, start to know like, oh, I fired a piece and it exploded in the kiln because it had water in it. It's a very different um, looking explosion. Luckily, I learned most of this while I was at the college, right? So I didn't have to like ruin a bunch of my own work. I just saw other people's work explode, which is kind of, you know, it's sad, but at the same time, it's like, you know, you said it was ready to go in the kiln and <laughs> you made a mistake. But there, there's different ways you can kind of take a piece and put it up against your cheek and your cheek can be a little more sensitive to um, cold when you touch a pot next to it. So if it feels like it's extra cold when you put it against your cheek, then it can mean it has a little bit of moisture in it. One of the things I do to help kind of alleviate that issue though, like even if a piece did go in the kiln with a little bit of water in it, is I run my kilns with a preheat. So I heat them up to about 200 degrees for, depending on how I think the quality of the pieces are. So if they're fairly new, maybe made that week, I'll put maybe a four to six hour preheat on them. So they're just in the kiln at 200 degrees. So that, you know, water boils at 220. So I just kind of want to put the, the kiln just under where the water boils, because if there's water in the piece when you start to fire it, the water expands and then it explodes the piece. It shatters into a bunch of little pieces. So it's like the pressure from the water expanding just makes the clay fall apart. So if you do a preheat where you're heating it up just below that temperature and you let it hold, then it's just dehydrating. And so you can force out any extra water that's in the clay during that uh, preheat period in the kiln. And if it's something like a glaze firing, you don't really need to do a really long preheat because the clay's already been fired once, you know, it's, it's ready to go in the kiln, but you just burn off a little bit of moisture that might be in it if the pieces were glazed recently, like that day. So maybe you do a two hour preheat, but. Have you ever had a project that you really, really liked get destroyed in a kiln? Oh, plenty of them. <laughs> oh. Happens all the time. Uh, I have no, like, I, I don't get sad about it. A lot of the, a lot of it is basically kind of, I'm always working towards the next piece. I'm not going to get hung up on the one that goes in the kiln. When I make it, that's kind of, already, I've already gotten the satisfaction of the piece, right? <laughs> I, I got to enjoy making it. And so that's kind of what I focus on rather than it, it surviving or getting to the finished product. I've had massive pieces that I've made like 75 pound pot and the bottom breaks out in the kiln, you know? So it's like, oh, here's six or eight hours of work that went into making this giant piece and then it doesn't survive, but it's just whatever. It's not a big deal. I've had sculptures that I've spent lots of time um, break coming out of the kiln. And then I've also done like, entire glaze loads where the glaze doesn't work and I have glaze defects on all of my pieces so I've had entire kiln loads of work you know have to be thrown away or or worked on and it's just one of those things you have to learn to let go like I, I'm not I'm not worried about it you learn from those mistakes you learn what may have gone wrong and you try to adjust for it and that's just part of part of the process really you have to <laughs> take your lumps as they come so to speak you know, you got to just work through it and be tenacious. And it's a lot like learning how to throw in the first place. You're going to make a lot of pieces that don't survive. And then you're going to have, you know, that really nice one. And to me, it's not actually finished unless it's sold, you know, <laughs> or it's sitting on a shelf in my house. So this is where it is. You have to learn to live with it. Uh, fragileness and the fact that it's not going to last forever. Sometimes people dig up shards of clay from ancient civilizations, but it's a shard, you know, <laughs> it's not the full thing. And that could have happened the day it was made or, <laughs> or when, when the house fell on it. So you, don't, you never know. It's, everything's temporary.
I'm just going to do kind of a what I would consider a, a tighter form, not quite as abstract, where I just use the rib to make just kind of a nice set of lines or shape across this form. So I'm just going to kind of put in a little, little lift here using that technique where I drive the edge of the rib into the side of the clay again. And then just like I did on that vase earlier, I can take So you can make like this would be more of like a tankard or just a really clean line mug. This it's the type of mug that I use for logos. If someone wants a custom piece, then this is a really nice area to apply a custom design to because it's a nice flat surface. That's just a real quick production piece. Does anyone have any uh, last questions for me before I start to? Wind down here. I think I've asked all of my questions. <laughs> Charlie, do you have any questions? No, no. It, it was. Uh, I'd like to try that um, spiral effect next time we come by. Yeah, we can do that. I don't know if I'm ready for a bank just yet, but. Oh, that's all right. <laughs> It'd be a pretty plain pig. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Those are really neat, though. Thank you. So you, I, I, you. Are you able to tell us where where you where they're so being sold in Berlin? Uh, it's at the uh, Worcester County Arts Council. So where? The pigs. The pigs are here too. Yeah. The oh, pigs, okay. The pigs are at the Art League, but the um, the bottles and the show that I was talking about are at the Worcester County Arts Council in Berlin. The uh, opening for my featured artist show is actually this coming Friday. That reminds me of like spin art. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's my $1,200 spin art. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's good. I'm good. Thank you. Yeah, all right. Perfect. <laughs> Well, thank you guys so much for coming today. I really appreciate it. And we're going to post this on our social media too. So um, if thank you, you. want to watch it again or want to go back and see if you can copy some techniques or... Look at that, how cool that is. A mandala. Are you going to be at that arts, are you going to be at that arts thing this Sunday, Robbie? I'll be there Friday. Yep. Okay. Well, that's great. All right. That's so neat. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Right. Thank you, guys, you're so much, welcome. Robbie. Thank you. We really Thanks, appreciate Robbie. it. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks so much. <laughs> Everyone, have a great day. Thank you. Thanks. For spending you too. This afternoon with me. Yep. <laughs> it's been lots of fun. Wonderful. Thank you. Glad so you enjoyed neat. it. Yep. <laughs> well, you should see what he's doing with the thing. I know. <laughs> you should see what he's doing with this plate. The the plate that spins spinning real slow making like mandalas holy shoot <laughs> that's great so, neat. so these are um, these types of designs can easily be put into plates and platters so it's, it's kind of a fun thing to play with because I can get here and do, do stuff like this and then later I can actually put it into a, a form yeah it's a fun way to clean up. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks again, guys. All right. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Right,